But if you're building spacecraft, if you're building launch vehicles, it's a tougher play. And I think actually the VC model ends up kind of distorting business plans because what mm -hmm. it forces you to do is you've got to come up with very high returns in a very short yes. period of time. And in order to do that, you have to create a very aggressive business plan and it creates a little bit of a vicious cycle because a very aggressive business plan that's going to generate lots of profit requires lots of money up front. Right. And all of this hinges on capture of very large markets. And so you look at small launch, 130 vehicles, each one is going to launch 50 times a year. And you got companies out there with billion dollar valuations, $5 million launches, 50 launches a year and a billion dollar valuation. Yeah. I actually did some back of the envelope discounted cash flows of what yeah. it would take to get there. And you have to end up with like 250 launches a year, 20% profit margins. And that's crazy. We're back with another episode of the Cold Star Project. I'm your host, Jason Koenig, and the founder of this thing, Cold Star Technologies of Data Science and Process Improvement Firm. I am here with Dr. Andrew Aldrin, a uh, famous last name. Um, he goes by Andy. And uh, really glad to have you here. Thanks for it's, showing up. It's my pleasure to be here. You bet. Well, I was, I was super excited. Uh, I saw your name come across suggested connections on LinkedIn. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> there's, there's somebody I should be connected with. And you quickly responded and, and uh, were interested in being on the show. So you, um, you have a very interesting background. Obviously, you've got your, your doctorate. Um, you're the director of something called the Aldrin Space Institute at Florida Institute of Technology. Um, the ISU Center for Space Entrepreneurship, and you were the president of a company called Moon Express that uh, I really would like to dig into with you because commercial um, perspectives are really interesting for the, the viewers, right. listeners of this show. So let's begin with uh, some, some fun, a fun topic here. Tell us about the purpose of the Commercial uh, Space Studies Graduate Certificate Program, which you offer. Um, very briefly, who it's for, how many students, and, and the options. Yeah, so... Um you know, probably, I guess it's been four years ago or so now, the International Space University, which I, I assume you've been, you've been talking with them mm -hmm. or connected with them in some way, shape, or form. It's really neat to. It's an exceptional organization. But they're kind of European-based, and they do yeah. space education. And they um, wanted to get some things started in the United States, and specifically with respect to commercial space. So um, they put out an RFP, and then, you know, lots of, Lots of universities applied to it, and we got selected. And we, uh, you know, it took us a while to actually pull everything together, but we had our first program last year. And with the way the program is structured, I mean, the institute nice. itself does. We do workshops. We got some research programs going on, kind of the usual stuff you'd see in universities. But the core program is a summer studies program. It's a graduate certificate program. So we're really looking for students that have just graduated you know, with a degree in engineering, business, what have you, and that are actually looking to continue their education in a lot of cases. And so we get students that have been engineering undergraduate, or maybe they're already in graduate school doing aerospace engineering, or business, you know, sort of classic business education, engineering management. We have students that have come from policy schools. And what we do is we give them a full semester of just sort of high intensity space education, focusing on commercial markets, commercial systems. And we do this all in an exceptional location um, at the visitor complex at Kennedy Space Center. And, and then and we do it in six weeks. Hmm. So it's super intensive. It's in kind of the space capital, I think, of the United States. And um, it's just, it's a great experience. And so we had our first program this past summer. Um, with all of the uncertainty, we're trying to figure out exactly how we're going to do it this summer. Um, it, it may not be completely at the visitor complex. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I mean, honestly, we're just, what we're doing right now is we're going out to students um, who've expressed interest in the program and trying to find out what it is that they really want to do if we need to, to move things online. And so, you know, what you're doing here with Cold Stars is kind of a, a, a great opportunity um, to start you know, understanding more about how you communicate effectively um, without being in person. Huh. Yeah, that is that is critical. And uh, as I 
sort of pound away on in, in my shows. Uh, engineering skills are great, but you have to get your ideas adopted and be able to execute on um, affecting change. And that stuff is not that easy. So let's expand on what the curriculum looks like. I took a look through the website. It's beautiful. It looks like there's a strong theory and practical uh, training combination that I really liked. Uh, what kind of things do the students do? So we got we got four four classes, and they're um, they actually reside in at least three different colleges within um, Florida Tech. We've got classes that are in the business school, and the business college of business, college of humanities, and um, and college of engineering even. Um, so let me kind of go through the four classes. Yeah. Um, kind of the, the core classes engineer is, is space systems and technologies. And um, you'll see a recurring theme, which is we have we bring in faculty from outside um, to teach most of these courses. So um, Angie Buckley from the Aerospace Corporation and Chris Welsh from ISU teach that course. And what we're trying to do is you know recognize we've got students that are coming from business. We've got students that are coming from policy and we've got engineering students and you have to get them all talking about an engineering topic. Um, and so what we do is we make things, we, we give the engineers kind of the tough technical problems to, to solve in the course and, and the business people learn a lot about systems, but you're not doing the kind of, uh, you're not doing fluid dynamics or things like that. You're getting taught that at, in your regular engineering curriculum what we're looking at is entire systems. Hmm. And so um, in that course, um, you know, we look at various systems and students get as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a project to do, to actually come up with some kind of a commercial space system that they put together. You know, literally we give them like uh, eight hours or something to pull something together. So they've got, a, it's not a detailed design project, but it's, it starts to get them working together. Hmm. That's one course. The second course that I'll talk about is um, um, commercial programs, global commercial programs. And what we do with that course is actually put the students inside a commercial company, but ask them to understand the overall, overall environment that they live in. So to understand the markets, not just as let's just say the launch market, but start talking about space transportation and indeed overall transportation markets. So, you know, it's kind of, it's looking at things a little Bit the way Jeff Bezos does, which is, you know, he's look, he says he's in the infrastructure business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you start looking at markets that way. And you're also looking at um, not just your competitors, but what are potential substitutes that are outside? Mm -hmm. What are what are what's the regulatory environment? We get into that a lot more in another course. Um, but it's sort of very broad look at your overall environment. And, and the core project that you do in that course is each each student actually takes as a project to look at the market landscape for a, for a company that they define. And it's what they don't do is focus so much on the products and what the company is developing, but understand where that company fits in the overall ecosystem. And a really interesting thing, um, we had one great success story this last um, semester where a student um, actually did her study on Made in Space, which is a great mm -hmm. company. And, and then she went out and had an interview with Made in Space and got the job. And I'd like to think that, that we made her a lot smarter and, and helped her get the job. The truth is, she's a very smart student to begin with. And, and I, you know, she was, she'd have gotten the job anyway, but I'm still going to take credit for it. Um, <laughs> third course is uh, policy and law. And um, there I co-teach that course with, um, with Henry Hertzfeld, who runs the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University. Uh, and Henry handles the, the legal part of it, and Henry has been a space lawyer and economist, interestingly, mm -hmm. for decades, literally. Anyway, Henry talks about space law. What I talk about is uh, what I call national space innovation systems. And so what we do is we look at various countries and put their space system in the context of a national innovation system. So you're not just looking at the nuts and bolts of a program but you're looking at how that fits into the economy, how it fits into national political goals, how it fits into the resource base of the, of the country, you know, not just physical resources, but what are the skill resources that they have. And you try and look for um, innovation systems that match what the policy goals are. And, and in a lot of cases, you'll look at something and say, well, it's not a great match, but it does give students 
a framework to look at look at different countries rather than just you know let's look at who's going to the moon let's understand the broad capabilities um, so that's that course the um, the foundation course to the whole thing of course is space entrepreneurship I think in the, in the catalog we call it technical entrepreneurship hmm. and there um, we're really fortunate to have Greg Autry from the University of Southern California who's really the only professor of entrepreneurship that's that's working in the space area and and he's really focusing his curriculum on space entrepreneurship and there students will learn the nuts and bolts of, of how you build a business how you build the right accounting systems and things like that but they'll also get together in groups and build I business concepts hmm. and then at the end they'll present those concepts and we've even got a venture capital firm hmm. uh, Chad Anderson space Angel Space Capital um, to look at these and see if we've got any ideas that are investable. If if we don't have ideas that are investable, maybe we can send the students off into um, into an incubator that will uh, an incubator system that we have. The first year, to, to be honest, we didn't really have any ideas that looked investable, and I think the students are mostly taking these classes because they wanted to get a job. And um, either actually all of the students who are looking for jobs have jobs now we've got them placed in we've got one starting a new business uh another one in a, as i mentioned in maiden space but uh a couple of students have actually gone on to take jobs in space in traditional aerospace companies hmm. um and then a, a few others are, are just going on to grad school so that's it's been a good year i think i think what our program offers is a combination of sound academic theory mm -hmm. and um, and then the practical experience of real things happening in space. And that kind of brings me to what's another, I think, key thing that we do is because we're in Florida, we get lots, there are lots of space people there anyway, right? But when people come in for a launch or other things like that, we get lots of people just sort of flowing through. Mm -hmm. And so we had uh, 17 guest lecturers come in uh, everything from David Thompson, who was the founder and, and CEO of Orbital Sciences until they were um, bought out by Northrop, and um, Chad Anderson, of course, from Space Angels, um, a couple of other CEOs from small companies, smallish companies, uh, Grant Anderson from Paragon. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was, um, uh, we actually had um, NASA's chief economist, Alex McDonald, came in and talked to us, which was great. Huh. So you know, the students get the opportunity to interact with real people out there that are doing real things and by the way, hiring people. <laughs> very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of graduate and PhD students who listen to this show um, more than I thought and they've been sharing the show around amongst themselves. Awesome. So I think this is a really important episode. So you folks listen up. <laughs> <laughs> and here is talking to you, and I am echoing this because I see this a lot uh, in in the space industry. You get uh, a fellow or a couple of people who have a technical idea to create some sort of technical capability, um, but they have not thought it through in terms of the market and right. who's the customer going to be and how, who's going to pay for this and how's it going to work. And uh, and this happens a lot, a lot more than you might think. And so they. They, they don't understand why the investors don't get excited about the technical capability and then they're frustrated right. and they don't get any money and it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so right. you can avoid that uh, by everything that I'm hearing about uh, the program that, that uh, Dr. Aldrin is running here is so valuable. It is so valuable. I, mean, I haven't had those advantages. I've had to make my own way in, in this space <laughs> industry and stumble around and try and find out, like, who will pay for what here? Well, how can I help? Come and join us this right. summer. Right. Yes. So hmm. it, you uh, know, once we get the I, dates figured out. <laughs> I had, yeah, I had um, interesting experiences in aerospace. I'm going to uh, give you just um, – yeah. it's going to be a little bit of a um, dirt road, but – you know, you talked about my interesting background. It's, um, it, it's been an interesting career. I actually yeah. started my life as a Sovietologist and, and I uh, got my PhD at UCLA in political science. I wrote my dissertation on how the Soviet Union beat the United States into space. Hmm. And, and I was at the Rand Corporation and that's what I was gonna do. I was gonna do, you know, international defense industrial stuff. Um, and then the Soviet Union went away. Yeah. And <laughs> so I had, spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union, and I knew a lot about, about their, the aerospace system with, of what was now Russia. And um, so I, I had 
a couple of companies asked me if I wanted to come work for them, and I did. So I ended up in, in aerospace actually quite by accident. It wasn't my intention at all. And, um, but I ended up at Boeing. Um, mm -hmm. At one point, I was running business development strategy uh, and advanced programs for their NASA business unit um, and for actually their commercial businesses. As, and then ultimately, I went to their launch uh, business and did the same thing there and then moved out to ULA. But while I was in that position, um, we had a lot of brilliant, brilliant technical people mm -hmm. with great ideas. But you know, a brilliant technology without a business is, you're playing solitaire, you know? That's what it is. It's a game that nobody really cares about. You can win, I guess, <laughs> but nobody cares. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time um, working with, with brilliant engineers, helping them turn things into real businesses or release concepts that were consistent with what our business was trying to achieve. And so that was actually one of the real motivating factors in, um, in formulating this program was to, to take great engineers mm -hmm. and give them all of the background that they really need to understand not just the company they're in, but their environment, policy environment, the, the legal environment and and the fact that you have to you know you have to make money i mean ultimately yeah. one of the mantras of our program is profit equals revenue minus cost don't forget that because mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't have that you don't have a business it sounds so simple and yet we see companies uh, running out of money all the time right everybody's got a burn rate we've got a burn rate right. and it's going on all the time whether uh, you've got customers or not, whether you're manufacturing or not, whether anybody's using your thing or not. So, yeah, it's it's so yeah. critical. I, I wonder, Andy, is there an area that you've noticed uh, for graduate students, space graduate students, where they they're missing something most often, where they need perspective or experience? And and I think we've touched a little bit on it, but I'd like to expand on that. Yeah, I think it it, it gets back to what I said that we have everybody comes in with some kind of an idea. Hmm. and or they make up an idea and but they start out with the idea of a thing or a product or a service and and i think what we try and do is turn them turn the telescope around if you will and say hmm. start with a market start with a need a need which has money attached to it a customer somebody who will buy something and then worry about the thing and so that's something that you'll get in uh in all of the courses that we're talking about it's just it's not it's not the thing it's the market that matters. Mm -hmm. and so yeah i think that's one of the the things that's really important i think the other thing that's important is perspective mm -hmm. uh, we teach engineers to be brilliant at specific technologies and things and we teach most business people to be very good at at solving problems and working spreadsheets mm -hmm. we don't teach big concepts very well at all. It doesn't hmm. fit into departments at universities. You have to create things that are interdisciplinary. And so I think that's what we're bringing. And that is, you know, the interdisciplinary element of it is really something that draws back on International Space University. That's one of their mantras, interdisciplinary, inter international, intercultural. Right, right. I, I go back to the mid 90s when I was in this thing called the operations management program where we took 10 and 11 courses wow. a term for a couple of years and had a 40% failure rate. Uh, 50 people started that program and 30 people graduated and we were in this teamwork program. And that was so important because your grade depended on four or five other people as well. Right. And they had to show up and, uh, and that weeded out a few people in the first year. And, and it's not pretty, <laughs> and you learn a lot. And, and so if you're an engineer and all you've worked on are solo projects all through your university career, you're gonna come out with a very different experience and you're gonna need what's in this program here that, that Andy's talking about. And that's about. a hard lesson for students that, you know, well, I did my part of it, I was great. Right, right. Why didn't I, why didn't I get an A? Well, your project sucked, okay? And <laughs> yeah. you're responsible for your project. If, if the business goes out of business, you're just as much out of job as every out of a job as everyone else. So yeah, that's a tough lesson. Yeah, yeah. The universe doesn't care how hard you work, <laughs> in a sense, as an individual. I like so, that. Yeah, I I think I took it from uh, Ellie Badesit Jr. I think he was uh, writing a a short uh -huh. story, science fiction author. Um, 
let's see here. I, I've got my list of questions over here on the big screen. And, and so I'm looking down here and you have had Space Angels, uh, Angel Investors, as a supporting partner. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned that before, had the CEO come in and do a talk in that. What have you learned about having them as a supporting partner? It's very unusual. So, um, yeah, it is because um, I'm, Chad is sometimes it called me the space curmudgeon because <laughs> you kind of have, you have to demonstrate that this stuff makes sense to me. And that's mm -hmm. another kind of theme that keeps coming out. Um, and it's been an education for me personally, working with Chad and understanding the, um, the incentives and, and the whole structure of the new start ventures, venture capital system, because it's, it's, um, it's different from what a classic business model is going to tell you. And I'm, I, I still think that at the end of the day, valuations have got to make sense, but Chad lives in a different world. And so just mm -hmm. understanding that world for me personally has been incredibly valuable. The other thing that Chad brings is, um, you know, he doesn't make this stuff up. Mm -hmm. He's, great at pulling together the right data, putting it together in the right format. And I think um, he's, he's brilliant. And what Space Angels does, I think, is really, really productive because it, it has to make sense for Chad, too. And so that's just tremendously valuable. Uh, and having someone involved in it that really does understand businesses and what makes sense is really important for the students because mm -hmm. it's not just um, it's not just hanging out a shingle and, um, <laughs> yep. and, and making it work. And I think, you know, one of the other things that, that I, that I'm learning from Chad is that, um, I won't say that the easy money has been made, but making money is going to be much harder in this business in the future than that was yeah. before two weeks ago. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. because, you know, we'd sort of had the first wave and a lot of, money got spent and a lot of companies mm -hmm. went out of business and things like that. And I think that investors are getting a lot smarter and a lot more careful about what they're putting money into. Um, and so we need to train better people as investors. We need to train better people as managers. We need to train better people as entrepreneurs. And so, you know, Chad has helped bring, bring that home to me. Okay, it's super important. And so for, for students or founders listening to this, watching this, understand that there is, um, and I, I've heard about this shift as well, like, like it's almost dot com era, like, okay, yeah. we were throwing money at this thing, we didn't really understand it. But now there's this second wave of well, a lot of this failed. And, uh, and now we're a little more strict on, on understanding that model. But my key takeaway from hearing you, Andy, is that there is a model or there are conditions about investing that we can learn from these angel investors. Yeah. It's not some weird esoteric thing. It is something that, that we can learn and then go and build into our business model. Well, I think there's a lot we need to learn as an emerging industry. And, and mm. part of it is um, don't assume that the venture capital model is the only model out there and the only model that works because it's not a good fit for most space ventures. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're a data play and just taking data from, uh, from existing space systems, yeah. repackaging, analyzing that data, what, however you do that, that looks an awful lot like a Silicon Valley IT firm. Yeah. But if you're building spacecraft, if you're building launch vehicles, it's, it's a tougher play. And I think, actually the VC model ends up kind of distorting business plans because what mm -hmm. it forces you to do is you've got to come up with very high returns in a very short yes. period of time. And in order to do that, you have to create a very aggressive business plan and it creates a little bit of a vicious cycle because a very aggressive business plan that's going to generate lots of profit requires lots of money up front. Right. And all <laughs> of this hinges on capture of very large markets. And so you look at, you look at small launch mm -hmm. and 130 vehicles, each one is going to launch 50 times a year. And, and you got companies mm -hmm. out there with billion dollar valuations, mm -hmm. $5 million launches, 50 launches a year and a billion dollar valuation. 
I, I actually did some back of the envelope discounted cash flows of what yeah. it would take to get there. And you have to end up with like 250 launches a year, 20% profit margins. And that's crazy. And at yeah. some point, you know, at some point, a, a rational business model evaluation, this would say, all right, you know what, if, the, if, if you got 50 launches a year, you got reasonable 10% profits, you know, maybe you're worth 250 million as a, at a, at a reasonable valuation. So everything between 250 and a billion is, um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. A fairy tale right now. So yeah, uh, our, our listeners and viewers can go read Blitz Scaling by Reed Hoffman and find out all about what uh, Andy just talked about there. Uh, because he, he describes that whole thing about uh, if you're galloping ahead. And I, and I talk about that in, in our marketing as well, because we okay. companies do that. But uh, Reed says, and he, he's a LinkedIn founder um, and, and a VC, move, move uh, bits or bytes, not atoms. So you want information, not uh, uh, physical things, just like we talked about to be able to do this. And you need to um, risk galloping ahead of your supply lines in order to to go do this and disaster and that is not a good recipe for a physical uh, based launch firm right so I, i've seen this i've seen this myself and god gee what do i do about it because i profess to help companies in that situation right. who are trying to move atoms do better and, uh, and yeah there's a lot to it and that's why we've got this um long description of all the items that we help companies with so well and so i think that yeah. there are there are other business models that are out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are companies um, which have grown at least for a period of time organically and mostly, mostly using government contracts. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, one of the ways to get around the problem of atom movers um, actually making money in a, in a challenging environment is you need to do the hard things first and and it may be more slowly than you'd really like to mm. but you need to find government sources um corporate funding is actually much more patient capital mm. you've got to look for patient capital and then at some point when you have the infrastructure and the market is there and you're ready to pounce on that market that exists right then you go get investment and then you can go through exponential exponential growth right. but not it, it's there aren't going to be that many SpaceXs. And remember, mm -hmm. SpaceX started with the most patient capital of all, your right. own pocketbook, right? right? And the government. <laughs> right. Let's not forget about that government. Yep, there's no, a lot of subsidy it, going it, on there. Right. Yeah. Jervitz did not build SpaceX on his own. There was a lot more money, government money in SpaceX than there was mm. DFJ money. Yep. Yeah. And, so uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, good for him for for picking out the direction and and sticking to it and developing that capability. You can't afford to be second best. You need to be first, and that requires speed. Now, if you're thinking that growth is supposed to be slow and steady, frankly, the way I was taught back in the '90s in the operations management and business administration programs, you are too slow. We have to adapt, and in space, it's no different than anywhere else. People like to think they're special in space, and it is fun, all the stuff we get to work on, but business is business. The fundamentals nowadays are conservative growth is not good. You need to run as fast as you can and risk outstripping your supply lines, which means in our world, using up the capital that we've got. That's a risk, but there is no prize for second place. There certainly is no prize for third. If you want to scale operationally fast, come talk to us at Cold Star Tech. We are the process experts for scaling fast. Now back to the interview. So let's move into commercial experience that you've had, uh, you know, things that you, where you've been in the, the driver's seat in right. that role. Um, they're scary. It's terrifying running your own business. Uh, like I said, you've got that burn rate, which is eating you alive all the time. And yeah, you, maybe you've got a bunch of money, but uh, you're on a ticking time clock uh, the moment that you start. And it's like, what can I build and ship and get paid for before that money runs out? So you were yeah. president of, uh, of an organization called Moon Express. Uh, right. Tell us about what that was and what your biggest takeaway was from that whole experience. Uh, Moon Express was a company that was really started by Bob Richards um, hmm. 
uh, Naveen Jain and Barney Pill. Um, and, and it was started primarily at, at about the time of the launch of the Google Lunar X Prize. Mm. And the, the business model was go capture the Google, Google Lunar X Prize. There will be lots of lunar missions after that. Um, obviously, the, the Google Lunar X Prize, at, and at the time, Remember, the U.S. government back in 2003, 2004, we were going to be spending $170 billion to go to the moon. And that was great. Um, but then the government pivoted to Mars and interest in the moon kind of went away. Nevertheless, you know, Bob kept the company together and continued to move on. Um, he asked me to come and run it for a while. And I think the, um, the thing that was exciting about it for me um, there is the sort of terror and, 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 and essentially living from, um, living from revenue stream to revenue stream. Um, but what I realized and the most important thing for me is that I guess there are two lessons. One that one really positive lesson, the really positive lesson is that you can do incredible things in incredibly short periods of time. So mm. a couple of examples, we built a, um, an engine using different propulsion fuels, um, not completely unheard of, but there's really nothing out there doing these propellants. And, and we did it literally from blank sheet, no, no test stands, no nothing, to, um, to test fires in about four months. And that's pretty incredible. Um, and and that's, we weren't unique in that. Mm. I talk to companies all the time that are doing things like that today. But 10 years ago, it was unthinkable. I mean, you go to, to Rocketdyne and it's 10 years and a billion dollars, maybe for a lot bigger <laughs> engine. This wasn't a trivial engine. This is like a thousand pound thrust. Um, so you can do incredible things in very short periods of time. We did the, the lunar lander demonstration, which uh, we successfully captured one of the Google Lunar X Prize interim prizes. Uh, we did that in, I think, three months, <laughs> pretty much clean sheet um, to testing. Um, so you can do incredible things. That's one, one lesson that you really can. The other lesson is, um, and it, it's something I learned talking with other companies in Silicon Valley, and it's only gotten reinforced more recently, is um, program management tools weren't very good. Hmm. And, and tended, you know, in some cases, you try and take what's established industry practices, which aren't really appropriate. I mean, you can't, it's really difficult to do schedule-based management because your your schedule is determined by the amount of fuel you've got, and the fuel is money. And so using that will only end up kind of frustrating you and and missing deadlines. Hmm. What what it has to be more focused on is kind of taking a step back and let's look at the key risks we need to burn down to achieve something. And so risk-based management is probably a much better approach and and your velocity is kind of determined by um how much money you've got i mean mm -hmm. there is kind of i think sometimes um because you've got your staff and your staff is a fixed resource mm -hmm. to bring everything in house and most of the kit most of the time that's appropriate um so um i think that the management tools for atom building if you will to take your point um, hardware firms need to be rethought a little bit, maybe a lot, um, to work better in this environment. And um, that's actually something we're looking at at Florida Tech in the engineering management program. Um, but at any rate, those were kind of the two really key lessons that I've got. Maybe there's a third, which is that in, in a startup company, um, even if it's been around for a while, everybody has to do everything. Mm -hmm. And so it's not enough to be a great thermal engineer because at some point in time mm -hmm. you're you know you'll do your thermal stuff at the front end and at the back end and in between you end up doing lots of other stuff and and not only do you do other engineering disciplines but you've got to be better at you've got to be able to do program management and everybody every day has to be doing marketing and everybody needs to understand the broader market the environment mm -hmm. and and what effect what you're doing has on the whole company, right? You have to know where you fit in. And that's very different from a typical, you know, traditional large aerospace company. Hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, those are great insights. And I'm hearing a lot of, you'll see this stuff in the, in the Reed Hoffman book as well about the uh, don't hire specialists just to be that one thing. Um, I think well, you can, but it's hard <laughs> for a little while. Yeah, it might, it might uh, cause you trouble. But you were mentioning everybody's on the job of marketing. And that's a tough thing for a lot of people. They've got hangups about it. They don't like to promote yeah. themselves. Um, it, it can be tough. So that, again, goes back to the, uh, the managing change and the, the giving the vision to people, I think. And uh, right. I've, watched, I've watched many speakers talk about vision. And one, one takeaway uh, is you have to say something over and over and over and over again so many times that they begin to mock you about it and that's when you know that it's entered their consciousness and so when they're having that stimulus response they're out in the field they're not near their office and they need to come up with a quick reaction they're going to say finally the vision that you want them to say and it, it has to go that far you can't just say something once like oh andy we're all about business now okay well uh, and expect that your people are gonna know that understand it come up with it in the moment that they need it so well, and this is this is something that really separates um some of the new star companies i mean i, I talk about spacex and blue as if they're new stars they're not really i mean they are but they're very different. But I think um, the vision, the shared vision that mm. every one of those, at both of those companies has, and I suspect, you know, lots of other companies um, is something that doesn't exist at many large traditional mm -hmm. aerospace companies mm. anymore. You know, it mm -hmm. did, uh, it did, if you go back and look at say the early days of Skunk Works, maybe, mm. um, it, you know, interestingly, um, it did, uh, in what I'd like to call the, the world's first biggest space startup, which was NASA, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, yep. if you the culture. NASA, yep. Yeah. The, I mean, there were about, written documents after the Gus Grissom fire. Um, there was that, that document about, you know, we're never going to let this happen again. Basically, we're better than this. Yeah. Well, and it was also the whole, the organization behaved like a startup. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. You know, you know uh, the John Hubalt story where mm. Hubalt literally came from, you know, he was an engineer at Langley and, and went to Von Braun and said, I've got a better idea for how to get to the moon. And you think about NASA today and, mm. and the ability for ideas to get from the bottom to the top that mm -hmm. quickly and actually get adopted. Mm. It's, it doesn't happen very yeah. well. Anyway, that's right. why I like to call it like <laughs> the first big startup. But the, the obviously... NASA had, well, NASA had a largely shared vision. You still kind of had the science people and um, other parts that were saying, well, wait a minute, you know, all we, the agency is doing more than just going to the moon. Well, you know, kind of the, the truth was, as far as Kennedy was concerned, they weren't. Right. They were just going to the yeah. moon. Very um, <laughs> limited anyway. scope. Uh, for folks who are going, what the heck are they talking about? Uh, what's this vision thing? Um, you can go check out the book Vivid Vision by Cameron Harold. Uh, I think you'll enjoy that. It's got quite a, a number of exercises on uh, how to develop that viv vivid vision and bring it to your, your people. Uh, Andy, you've also had experience, as, as you mentioned, in a couple different roles as business development director at Boeing in a couple different areas. And I'm curious what you learned there that could be applicable to space executives today. Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing is that... Um, Entrepreneurship can happen in big organizations. Um, the organizations have to get better at treating, establishing entrepreneurship. So, for example, um, I'll, I'll just use I'll use Skunk Works as an example because um, Skunk Works wasn't just creating a project and letting Kelly Johnson go run it. It was about creating an organization and letting Kelly Johnson own that organization so that that was Kelly Johnson's organization. And he defended the boundaries of that organization. And um, that kind of delegation, if you will, and ownership that they give doesn't happen very often. I mean, lots of companies try and establish their own versions of things and put vice presidents in charge of them and say, go be skunk work. But until you empower that person and say, look, this is 
or, or that person takes it. I mean, it's, it's probably the case that Kelly Johnson took mm -hmm. more than Lockheed gave him. Although if you kind of look at it, um, Lockheed threw an awful lot of, of, um, uh, of, of cash at things that he wanted to do where it wasn't even clear hmm. that, you know, that there, was, there certainly wasn't a contract. So he got a lot of discretionary funding from Lockheed. Hmm. And so you got, you got to give Lockheed a lot of credit for that. But um, I think it's one of the things that entrepreneurs do is they create organizations. And so one of the things that I think needs to happen in large aerospace companies is you have to let organizations get created or maybe you buy them, but, you have to let them manage themselves as independent organizations. And um, that's, that's happening in some places. Um, I, think, I, I think it happened um, in Sierra Nevada with Mark mm -hmm. Sarangelo and his space systems unit, business unit. Um, I think they had a fair amount of autonomy and it was certainly Sarangelo's organization. Um, but you have to look for that entrepreneurship is about people and organizations. It's not about product and invention and technology. And, and that is a very different sentiment than, uh, than many you're going to hear out there. I happen to agree with it. <laughs> that it's been the experience of being punched in the face a few times uh, that but has taught me that. I, I've been talking to, um, you know, a lot of my old friends who remain executives in big companies mm -hmm. and they're becoming much more sympathetic to this kind of thing and trying to understand what they need to do uh, to make that happen. And um, you know, I'm not, I don't necessarily have the answer, but I've got a sense of where that answer lies. Right. And well, and you've got a, a six week, very quick program, very intense program that is going to give um, folks who have come out of graduate school, this right. kind of experience and this skill set. And I think it's amazing. I'm so glad that we connected and I was able to hear about it Thank in you. detail. Uh, I, let's wrap up with this. What are you looking uh, forward to the most in, in the space industry, both in terms of like technological developments and people heading into careers now? Yeah. So here's what I am looking forward to. Uh, I want to, I want to understand um, whether there's, whether there really is a paradigm shift, a paradigm mm -hmm. shift from one in which, um, government capital dominates to one in which private capital dominates. You know, with, mm. whether they're government markets or private markets, the, the point is who's, who's putting up the money to do it. Um, and a lot of people talk as if that paradigm shift has already occurred. I'm not yeah. sure. Mm -mm. I, in fact, yeah. I would say I don't think it, it yeah. will. And I mm. think that question and understanding um, what needs to happen uh, is for me one of the real intellectual challenges as i'll say uh, personal motivation is I'd, I'd like to do what i can to make that happen what what i can do to make it happen right now at this stage in my life is i, I can teach and um you know it's that's um at some point you kind of transit at least i've transitioned to thinking that that's probably one of the, the skills that i have right now that i want to develop and and if I can get a handful of people every year out there being smarter, asking hard questions and getting stuff done. Um, yeah. And then, and contributing to a paradigm shift, um, hmm. then I'll be super happy. Very, very cool. Uh, yeah. I, I am just as excited about that as, as you are. I know, uh, having talked with our technical engineering advisor, Dr. Rick Fleeter, he, he mentioned to me that um, the, the DOD funding and the NASA funding is still like 70% of the funding out there. The private industry yeah. is maybe 10 to 20%, and then the other chunk is made up of uh, foreign agencies. So commercial is nowhere near as a, um, as a big thing out there. And that's a big reason why the, the, this show is called The Cold Star Project. If you don't know, I run a, a little... A uh, summary show and, and a bit of news and information in that. It's a shorter format called uh, Make Space Boring. And we're putting on an event actually coming up on the 9th, uh, which we just talked about this morning um, yeah. with that title. And it's not about Make Space Dull. It's about getting user adoption and getting commercial right. involvement and getting it so that people are using space stuff, products made in space, 
uh, going to space jobs where it's just normal, where we don't even talk about it that much because the moment that it's at that saturation point and being used and there's money and it, we know it's safe, it's stable. Right. People are making money with it, they're investing. Um, nobody gets excited about the latest telecom thing or um, even, this is a, a from outside the industry a little bit, but missile defeat and missile defense. I see hundreds of millions to billions of dollars a week being invested in that. And uh, outside of that field, that very narrow field, nobody talks about it. The, the public doesn't even know and it's so right. much money and it's just right. there. It's happening, so I am yeah. I'm super excited. That's that would be a whole new um, discussion for us that could take mm -hmm. up another hour. But I agree yeah. with you completely that um, part of what's important for the success of space is making it boring. Because <laughs> I think sometimes the political attention that we attract mm. creates more problems than it does solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's more eyeballs on it. I've had other guests talk about this too on, on your project. So it's like now it has to work. And so we draw back maybe with the ambitiousness or, or the scope, which is not always a bad thing. But this, are we kind of. This is ourselves? a digression, but in my, um, <clears throat> yeah. in my explanation of how the Soviet Union um, beat the United States into space, it was fundamentally a question, uh, a process of entrepreneurship. Hmm. And one of the reasons, and it wasn't just one person, Sergei Korolev, who people often talk about, it was the organization that he created. But one of the reasons he was successful is quite by accident, he ended up in the Ministry of Artillery Production. He wanted mm. to be in aviation production. He wanted to be in media machine building. Nobody would actually take his program, which is part of the story. But the fact that he was in artillery made, made, made it the case that his customer was utterly ignorant of his technology. Huh. And so he pulled the wool over his eyes a lot of times. I mean, there's, a, um, there's one great quote that I've got from um, Marshall Malinowski after, after another test failure, hmm. and Korolev writes up the test report and of course calls the whole thing a brilliant success. And um, <laughs> Malinowski came back to him and he said, Korolev, you know, once again, you've made your govno uh, smell like roses. You can look up govno if mm -hmm. in Russia and find out what it is, but it's not hard to figure it out. Anyway, um, yeah, Korolev's ability to initially sell the thing as an anti-aircraft system, then as a mm -hmm. ballistic missile, and it was, by the way, a really, really crappy ballistic missile that he used mm -hmm. to launch Sputnik, but there was a great launch vehicle, and in fact, today, the launch vehicle that core the first stage of that vehicle is still being used for Soyuz, right? So it was a beautiful launch mm. vehicle, a crappy ICBM, and Korolev knew it. But he was able to sit, he was able to sell the government um, a crappy ICBM. Anyway, mm. that's a that's a whole nother story that we should talk mm. about. Today. And the and the technological development, being able to move it along. Uh, right. so that you can get somewhere. Yeah, this has been this has been fascinating. I definitely want you back if you're open to it. Uh, let's sure. discuss that after. My guest today has been Dr. Andrew Aldrin. He is the director of the Aldrin Space Institute at Florida Institute of Technology, um, the, the ISU Center for Space Entrepreneurship. Thanks for being here. Where can people connect with you or find out more about the program? Oh, so it is, hang on, it is <laughs> ISU CSE dot edu will get you there okay uh just to make life easier for people i think if i remember i'll put that in the notes in the doobly-doo -doo underneath do. okay. the, <laughs> underneath in the description of the youtube video or the uh the anchor podcast and if i forget someone please message me and tell me to do that but uh, odds are i'll remember all right dr aldred thanks for being here today pleasure talking with you jason have a great day Hey, this is Jason Kanigan, the host of the Cold Star Project and the founder of Cold Star Technologies. I've decided to do something new. I've started doing daily update videos on who I met and what I learned the previous day in the space field. And it's a great sort of follow me thing. You can learn what I learn. I'm meeting a heck of a lot of people and learning a lot of things really fast. And the space field is really disparate. There are tons of nooks and crannies to go into and explore from legal, operational, you know, regulatory compliance and gosh the end customer who would have thought about that right
So you can sign up for this. If you go to coldstartech.com slash MSB, that's short for Make Space Boring, the mission we're on, then you can sign up and in your email you will get a daily notification that the new video has been posted. I'm also thinking about doing some branded mini courses and summarizing papers as uh, I'm able to. So those will be some goodies that are in there as well. So if you're interested in that, go to coldstartech.com slash MSB and join us on the mission to make space boring. 